Hodikov was born on Attu in 1893 and brought to Unalaska as an orphan in 1910, staying first at the Methodist Orphanage, the Jesse Lee home, and later with relatives. He returned to Attu and married Anisia, sometimes called Anastasia Prokopuf, in 1920. Educated in Unalaska, he spoke better English than other Attu residents. English was still rarely spoken in Attu, but Hodikov spoke it well and very rapidly. May 1936, 101. In addition to being chief, Hodikov was also a lay reader in church, where he also spoke rapidly, and had the job of sending in weather reports. Hodikov was already a village leader in the early 1930s, when references to him appear in Coast Guard reports. The US Coast Guard was devoting special attention to Attu because Japanese fishing vessels were suspected in the area. Vicious storms at Attu in 1931 wrecked the Coast Guard station there, and three Barabaras, including one belonging to Hodikov, whose six-year-old son was killed in the storm. Hodikov lost another child when his young daughter Mary Hodikov, also age six, was taken to Unalaska for medical treatment and died during an operation to remove her tonsils, U.S. Coast Guard, 1931-36. His wife died before World War II, leaving him with three children, Angelina, Stephen and George. In 1936, Mike Hodikoff communicated with the outside world using Attu's wireless radio station. In the summer of 1934, a fleet of Navy ships was sent to survey the Aleutian Islands. During that time, the Navy erected a temporary radio station in the school building at Attu, and the radio men may have taught the chief to transmit messages. Alan May observed that when the Coast Guard came to town, all the villagers came aboard the ship to watch movies, May 1942-135. May wrote that Schroeder, the trader at Attu, supported the village inhabitants in several ways. He paid Mike Hodikoff 60 cents an hour to work for him and left him in charge of the store when Schroeder was out of town. Schroeder's wife, too, contributed to the welfare of the people there. May wrote... Mrs. Schroeder sent a dress as a gift to each woman on the island, which seems very nice of her, and she also sent toys for the kiddies. Mrs. Schroeder has never visited the island, but she does this once a year. May 1936, 122. Furthermore, Schroeder helped the Atuans pay for construction of the new church by advancing them money for lumber against their season's fox trapping. The old church had been a grass-roofed barabara, May 1936, 118. The women of Attu also raised money for the new church by selling baskets in Unalaska. Shapsnikov and Hudson, 1974-41. May noted that when Schroeder arrived in late July 1936, all the residents were pleased to see him, and he seemed like a nice man, May 1936, 129. The school was built in 1932, but it would be almost a decade before any teachers were persuaded to come to Attu for longer than brief summertime visits. Kohlhoff, 1995-6. Etta Jones arrived in 1941 to serve as a permanent teacher. Her husband, Foster Jones, assumed the duty of radio operator for the village. Both were 62 years old and had worked in other schools in Alaska. Brew, 2009, 149. Japanese presence was observed or suspected in Attu and other near islands since the first decades of the 20th century. Mike Hodikoff recalled that sometime around 1910, Japanese marauders had stolen fox skins from the Attuans and that they killed his father in the struggle that followed. Jones, 1946-40. This may have been one of the incidents Nick Goladoff refers to when he mentions the trappers who didn't return. Beginning in the early 1930s, the US military was watchful in the Aleutian Islands. The Navy sent a fleet of ships with amphibious aircraft to survey the Aleutians in the summer of 1934. As early as 1937, the Coast Guard officer on the Haida reported that on the way back from Attu, the boat hands were constantly checking for ships in fishing grounds. In August of 1938, when the Siane visited Attu, it also scouted along Holtz Bay, looking for evidence of Japanese occupancy, U.S. Coast Guard, 1939. When Etta Jones was assigned to teach in Attu, 
she and her husband, Foster Jones, knew there was danger of an attack from the Japanese. When boat operators Don and Ginger Pickard visited Atu in April 1942, Foster Jones told them that if the Japanese came, he would destroy his radio and the island's supplies of gasoline and oil. He was also training, drilling, the Atu men to protect their home, Stein ND-4-6. Etta Jones wrote in a letter that the American flag flew proudly above the village and that the Atuans disliked and distrusted the Japanese, Kohlhoff, 1995-40. Nick Golodoff recalls that when he was a little boy, people talked about hearing mysterious footsteps and finding other traces of pre-war visitors to Atu. Some people thought they were boogeymen, but later there was speculation that they were Japanese. The Atuans knew of the Japanese interest in the Aleutians, and they had already had encounters with Japanese fishing vessels and fur poachers. Alan May wrote in his journal that a captain of the Coast Guard had told him that Atu has been completely surveyed by the Japanese under the pretext of collecting flowers and butterflies without permission, and the natives cowed into not speaking about it. May 1936, 90. The chief of the village, Mike Hodikoff, told a visitor to Atu that personnel from the Japanese Navy had already been in the area to take measurements and soundings in the harbours, Stein and D5. On land, he said, they had left behind stakes with Japanese characters. Nutchuck, Simeon Oliver, 1946, 148. In May 1942, the US Navy took Chief Hodikoff and Alfred Prokopiev, the second chief, on board the seaplane tender USS Casco so the local men could show them likely shore landing spots. The Japanese bombed Dutch Harbour on June 3rd and 4, 1942. On Atu, in the early morning of June 7th, Foster Jones sent his usual weather report by radio. Charles McGee, teacher and radio operator on Atka, heard Jones say he had a hunch the Japanese were going to attack Atu. The radio went dead after that. Stein ND-8. As the Japanese forces approached Atu, they split up, and the larger force got lost. On the night of June 7, 1942, the Atu residents heard the Japanese boats coming into Holtz Bay, on the west side of the island. A contingent of soldiers came into the village on foot the next morning. It was Sunday morning, and the attack surprised the Atuans as they left church. Carter, 1994-35. The Japanese poured out of the hills west of the village, yelling and shooting. The frightened Aleuts ran to their homes. Rifle fire randomly struck the houses. At least two Aleuts were slightly wounded. One of them, Annie Hodikoff, the chief's wife, shot in. An older man counselled the young men that they were outnumbered and would never prevail. Six men, including Inokenti Golodov, ran away to the hills and stayed there all day. Later, the Japanese sent other Unangan residents to bring them back. The Unangan residents were gathered in the schoolhouse, and Foster and Etta Jones were questioned separately. The Japanese distributed mimeographed papers and announced to the native population of the village that they were liberated from the Americans. After the soldiers searched the houses for guns, ransacking them in the process, the Atuans were allowed to return home. There are conflicting accounts about what happened to Etta and Foster Jones, and the death of Foster Jones is especially controversial. According to one Unangan man, the Japanese knew Foster Jones had a radio and tortured him to find it, then killed him. Japanese reports and some Atuans, including Nick Golodov, have said that Foster Jones killed himself or attempted to commit suicide. Several sources agree that Etta Jones had wounds on her wrists, but that they were not mortal. According to some accounts, Foster Jones also slit his wrists. However, Mike Lokanin, who was ordered to bury Jones, denied this story. When he told Mike that Jones was dead, one of the Japanese soldiers pantomimed cutting his wrist to indicate that Jones had killed himself. Mike, however, was sceptical and said later that it was clear that Jones was deliberately killed. When Jones's body was exhumed at Atu in 1948, examination confirmed that he had been shot through the head. The next morning, the native residents of the village were assembled at the flagpole and the Japanese flag was raised. Later, some of the Atuans covertly mocked the flag, saying it looked like a target. 
One of them stole the American flag back and hid it from the Japanese. The Japanese soldiers took some food from the Atuans, but their commander returned the stolen food. He ordered the Unangan residents to stay in their houses and made the village off-limits to soldiers. The Japanese roped off the houses of the village, evidently more to discourage the Japanese soldiers from bothering or stealing from the Atuans than to keep the Atuans inside. The Japanese troops occupied Atu for three months before they took the Unangan residents to Japan. During that time, there was a death in the village, the elderly John Atumonov, a former chief. The Atuans found it difficult to fish, hunt or collect food because they had to get permission from the Japanese every time they went out in a boat. When they caught fish, the Japanese confiscated some for their own use. Because the Atuans were not allowed to go looking for firewood, they had to burn boards from their houses. One of the Japanese officers wrote in his diary that the Atuans loved to wear bright colours, and some wore berets. He noted that although alcohol was forbidden on Atu, the villagers enjoyed sake and beer when the Japanese soldiers offered it to them. The officer said the chief's son, Little Mike, George Hodikoff, accompanied them on mountain hikes and boat rides and often played the guitar and accordion for them. Some of the other children also befriended the Japanese during these weeks in the summer of 1942. Kiri Sugiyama, a military photographer, took several pictures of Atuan children. Some of the most familiar pictures of the Atuans are the ones the Japanese took after pinning numbers to every man, woman and child. These appear to have been taken in Atu before the villagers were taken to Japan. In 1942, January 12th, I had a baby girl named Tatiana. We stayed on Agatu all winter trapping foxes, and the boat was to take us off on February 15th or 19th. We were out of ammunition, flour, sugar, tea and milk. We were completely out of everything. We were beginning to starve when finally MS Point Reyes picked us up off Agatu. When we got in Atu, everything was blackout, and Mr. and Mrs. C. Foster Jones were in Atu. Mrs. Jones was the school teacher, and Mr. Jones was the radio man. There was plenty of snow in Atu then. When I got in Atu, I heard about war, war, but I never did see war, so I didn't care much, and I didn't think war would be at Alaska. Pretty soon I heard about Japanese are beginning to get near Alaska but I still think Japanese won't bother Atu because I know Atu is too small for them. We got word from the US government to pack up all our things. Sometime a boat will be in Atu to pick us up. So we already packed everything we got. Of course, we got the things we need out so we can use it temporarily in the month of May. One day we see vessel come to outside of harbour, and it was rough. Wind was blowing from the northeast, and as soon as we saw the boat coming, we thought it was Japanese boat. After she got outside the harbour, she wasn't anchored because wind was too rough for her to anchor out there, and she couldn't get inside the harbour. Maybe about half an hour later, we seen a launch coming into harbour. Some people still think it was Japanese boat. We look through scope. We can see letters on boat, USNTA. They had rough time coming in. Chief of Atu Mike Hodikoff and Second Chief Alfred Prokopuf went down on beach to see if that's our transportation. Of course, USN or USCG always visit Atu once or twice a year anyway, but people were talking about war. We got excited. When they come on beach, the officer got out and shake hands with both chiefs, and the chief asks if this is our boat. Officer says he hasn't got word to pick anyone up off Atu. All they had was ten army troops with their supplies to be taken ashore on Atu, but the weather was too rough to take anything over the sea in small boats, so they said they were going to land them on Kiska Island if they can. Officer want Mike Hodikoff and Alfred to go on Casco for two or three days so they can show a good landing place in any kind of weather. They stayed out four days and came back. The whole community sent out ten pelts to Dutch Harbour for sale to Navy, because they didn't have a thing in store. All they got was flour, few cans salmon, corned beef. No sugar, no butter, no milk or coffee. So they got some food off the casco. Mr Fred Schroeder did not come back from San Francisco with supplies for store. Later, last part of May, a sub come to Atu, a patrolling sub. All the men were invited to the sub, and when we got to the submarine, 
the captain took all the men inside and show inside of sub to everyone. And then he got on deck, and laying against the rail on the side, he asked some questions about how often the Japanese come around Atu a year in present time. I was standing back against cabin and talking to one of the crew, and I saw the captain was laying against the rail and the chain busted, and he went overboard in water and everyone on deck start to laugh. He fell backwards. When he reached the water he swim for the dory, which was ours, tied along the side of the sub. He couldn't pull himself in, so some men went down and help him in the dory. When he got on deck, he look at us and smile. He went below. A half hour later he come out and said he is ready to leave now. He told us as soon as we see Japanese boat, please notify Dutch Harbour. We got off and the sub took off too. That's the only US boat we've seen since 1942 to 1945, until at Okinawa when we got out of prison camp. June we had nice all the way. Not much rain, not much wind, sunshine all the time. Of course we were always standing by all the time for boat to pick us up. One day we heard over the radio the Japanese were bombing Dutch Harbour. We still hear war on radio. One day the Atu men were getting ready for going out to gather driftwood. They get their boats ready and fill up five-gallon can with gasoline and mix it with lube oil. Everything was ready for the next day. All over the village, everyone was in deep with a sad-looking face. You can tell something has gone happen, but they didn't know what is coming to them. I myself feel something strange going to happen to us. One of the other men said when I visited his house that he got some kind of heart trouble. He said maybe too much blood pressure. I asked him what is trouble. Oh, he said, my heart keep bothering me. I cannot go to sleep. My heart is just like it comes up to my throat. If it does that, I feel awful weakened. I asked him if he was going out for wood with the other men. He said, I don't feel like going, but anyways, I got to go. I myself didn't feel so good, but I didn't pay any attention to what I felt. Once in a while I can feel my heart thump just like it choke me, but I don't pay any attention to it. Most everyone looked sad to me. That day the village was so quiet, all I can hear is the gas motors of the power plant which runs three times a day by the schoolhouse. All we can hear is putt, putt, putt. Even the kids don't like to play. It was really nice at evening time. All the way out it was clear. The island seems to be sitting on top of the surface, out in the ocean. When I look at the mountain, everything is green. Flowers are beginning to blossom. Things look awful nice. When I sniff in air I can smell flowers, and looking to the mountains on each side of village, they look clearer than I ever saw them before. Little fog string around foot of mountains looks nice. Hardly any breeze come from the southwest. Most of the houses are smoking. When I pass some houses, I smell the boiled salmon. At my house too, my wife is boiling salmon for supper. I went down to the other end of village to see what's doing, and I met John on the road. I asked him if he was going out with his father tomorrow. He told me he will be out tomorrow if the weather keeps like this. He say it will be lots of fun tomorrow going to get seagull eggs and shooting ducks and getting wood. He asked me why don't I come in his boat. I already got a boat to go anyway. Most of the 14-footers carry two men and two or three five-gallon cans of gasoline and guns and cooking equipment. They don't have much room if they carry three men. I told him I already got to go in someone's boat. Now the sun was getting in back of the mountain and the shadow showed on the other side of the bay. When I looked toward the school, I see Mr Foster Jones was coming out of his power plant house, which is ten feet away from the school. He was oiling his motor. Of course he always run it at midnight too. I kept walking around. There was no wind and the ocean in the bay was just like water in a pan on the table. When I look out the bay, I can see the seagulls and sea parrots flying, and little birds waving beside the old ravens flying over the village and cawing. I never see so many crows in my life before as now, I thought to myself. I stopped in Alfred's house. His wife is my aunt, and sometimes I go visit her house. I had few cups of tea with her. I visited my aunt's house until it was getting a little dark. When I start to my own house, which is fifty or sixty feet away, I can hear chippy birds still chirping and still seagulls calling. I got home. When I got home, my wife had table ready and was waiting for me. My daughter was sleeping on the bed. My wife said things look very quiet, lonesome today. 
I had my supper and went to lay down on my bed, and something in my mind tells me something is going to happen. One thing was steady in my mind. Japanese will be here tomorrow, but I couldn't figure it out. My wife was sitting by me and said, Darling, are you going out with the other men for wood? I told her I'll be out tomorrow. Bring some seagull eggs when you come home, she said, and I told her, I will if I can. I told my wife that I have a hunch Japanese will be here sometime. She said to me, I hope not, they might kill everyone. Every time when my heart thumps, it makes me feel sick and weak. It's about 11pm, so I told my wife I am going to bed now. She told me, Darling, before you go to bed, get some water. There is no water in the house for morning. I got up and get water from my aunt's house. The sky was nice and clear. Then I go to bed. My wife was still up washing dishes. I didn't have to. That's why I go to sleep. Before the Japanese came to Atu in 1942, the Navy was going to take us away. The Navy came out in May and left about 10 men and 160 drums of gasoline, but they didn't take us away because it was too stormy. The Navy had 10 guns and they couldn't leave them all at Atu, so they took them to Kiska Harbour and the Japanese took them the same day they took Atu. The Japanese came in on June 7, 1942, and took Atu, and I guess they used the Navy's gasoline. The Japanese didn't land near our village. They landed on the west side in Holtz Bay. At night, we heard them coming in. Some of us young men were going to fight the Japanese. When we saw their ships coming, we got out our guns and all our bullets. Then one of the old men came and talked to us and told us not to fight. He said, we are not enough to fight so many men. Early in the morning, we saw the ship. We didn't know what kind of ship it was. About 11 a.m. after we had church, it was Sunday, the Japanese came into the village. They came in over the point on the west side of Chichagov Harbour. I didn't know what to do, so I ran off to the hill on the east side and hid under rocks. I stayed there half a day, and then I came back. I had nothing to eat. Six men stayed out all day. The Japanese were looking for them but couldn't find them, so they sent some of the village men out to bring them in. The first Japanese that came into our village were young kids. They were pretty bad. They shot into the houses. They hit Annie Hudikoff, Hodikoff, in the leg. The Japanese doctor fixed her. She died in Tacoma Hospital about 1946, after we got back from Japan. She had TB. Right after the first bunch of Japanese, the second bunch came. They were better. They were the officers, and they made the young kids stop shooting. Alex Prosov, 1947-1988 We were having church services in the little Russian church in Atu on Sunday morning, June 7, 1942, when boats entered the harbour. When the gunboats got closer to the village, we saw that they were Japanese. They started machine gun fire on the village. Some of our boys ran for their rifles to fight the Japanese, but Mike Hodikoff, our chief, said, Do not shoot. Maybe the Americans can save us yet. Mike Lokanin, 1947-1988, June 7, 42, Sunday in the morning, early when I was sleeping. Someone was knocking at my door, so I got up and look who it was. He said, I am Fred, with a frightened voice. I was wondering what was the matter, so I asked him what was the matter. He told me there is boats out there, and they are unknown boats, don't have any flag on either. One big, two-chimneyed boat. It might be Japanese. I asked how many there are. He was half frightened and shaking. He said he don't know, it looks like more than four or five. So then he got out and went down to his house, and I went to my bed again. It was 3am, it was too early for me to get up anyway. My wife was awake too. She asked me what was the matter and who was at the door. I told her it was Fred and she start to nurse her baby. I went back to sleep again. I usually get up at 7am and build a fire and make breakfast, eat with my wife. I was just about to get up when someone was at my door again. I got out of my bed and look out through the window. It is Fred again. I said to him, what's the trouble, Fred? He said the boats look like Japanese boats. I said to him, why, if it's Japanese, they could come right in the harbour and shoot the village. I said to him, why don't he go to the school and tell Mr Jones about it, and maybe he can send a wire to Dutch Harbour. 
I'm beginning to think it might be Japanese, too. I go in my house and Fred left. I said to my wife, Honey, Fred said Japanese boats outside the harbour. She lift her head off her pillow, look at her baby, and said, Oh, God bless us, what we'll do then? I said to her, Nothing we can do, honey. God knows what we'll do, and if our time is come, we'll be dead. If our hour is there, we'll be dead. So all we can do is think of God in our heart. That is all. She said, Oh, my dear little baby. She got tears in her eyes as she spoke. I told her I am going out and see what the others are doing. When I got out of my house and start to my aunt's house, I saw a little skiff was going out to Cannon Island to get a close look at the boats. When I got to my aunt's house, most of the village men were lined up alongside of the house, and they all were talking and talking, trying to figure out what kind of boats they are, what nationality. We saw a plane flying, circling around, but it didn't seem to bother anything at all. The third time he come to circle around, he got close. We saw the red ball on the wings and on each side of the plane. It was a single motor and two winged and had two men, one in back of the pilot. He was the gunner. He had machine guns on each side of him. It was about 8.30am everyone was getting ready for church. That was their last time for ever entering their church. Before church, my brother-in-law Alec and another person who went out in a skiff came ashore. They all said it is Japanese boats. We went to school to talk to Mr. C. Foster Jones and told him the Japanese boats are outside the harbour and we asked him to send message to Dutch Harbour because he got words to say to the US government when he sees Japanese or if we see Japanese and tell him. He is supposed to say, the boys were out today and didn't see a boat and they came home and they are going to have a fried codfish. That means that Japanese boats have come here. We ask him to send message. He said it might be US Marines or Navy. He was sending weather reports to Dutch Harbour, and I told him he might as well send a message because the boys have seen Japanese plane. He said if he make mistake and call up Dutch Harbour, it will be on his neck. So I just walk out. I see Mrs Jones curling her hair. I stopped by her room and told her I am afraid they are Japanese. She smiled and said to me, Oh, it might be Navy. If they are Japanese, why, they could have been in long time ago. I just walk out. I heard the church bell still ring. I did not go to church. Four of us went out to the point. The boat was so close we could see men walking on deck. Around twenty or twenty-five small landing barges went back and forth from Holtz Bay to the transport. We were walking along the edge of the hills, and the plane was flying round. Didn't seem to bother us, so we four of us thought it might be Americans too. So we just keep on walking to the edge of the hill and wave at the boat. It was nice and clear sunshine. I thought I heard a sound of talking. I told the others, Hey, listen. I stood there and looked around. Finally I see men coming from back of the mountain on foot. One of the boys I was with told me, Let's go to them, they might be Americans. I told him I don't want to go to them, and we stood and watched them running and crawling on the ground. We look at boats, and boats are raising red and white flags and moving farther out in the ocean. We all made a run toward the village to see what will happen. We see men running down the mountain and hills. As soon as they reach the beach and cross the creek, they open machine gun and rifle fire at the village. I thought to myself, my wife and daughter are goners now. I thought in my mind, it will be all right if they are killed without torture and suffering. The way the rifle and machine guns took off, we four of us thought nothing was left in the village. All we can see is men walking in the village, but they were the men who came to the village. We see Japanese running to the village with guns in their hands. The first building they get in is the school where Mr and Mrs Foster Jones is. We thought Foster might send message to Dutch Harbour. I told the boys, it's no use for us to go to the village now, the way the rifles and machine guns are shooting. Let's hide for the night and sneak up to the village at night and see if anything is left. So we crawled under a big rock which could weigh a thousand pounds. We heard a plane flying over us and were going to take a peek at it, but just about stuck our heads out when the big guns went off. Boy, we went back under the rock. We were piled on top of each other. We stayed there almost the whole morning and afternoon. In the late afternoon we heard somebody talking, and it sounded like one of our men. We said to each other, 
They might be hiding too. Suddenly I heard them calling us, but I didn't answer because I wanted to make sure it was our men. By God I could hear Willie and Fred's voices, so I pulled my head out and answered them. I got out from under the rock with the rest of the boys. We looked around but couldn't see anyone. I called out, Who is that? Call us, please show up if you are there. I saw someone sitting on a hill. It was Willie and Fred, who the Japanese sent to look for us. We all came out from under the rock and started to go home. We asked what was going on. Willie said in a low tone, Them little Japanese got us now. Fred said, We were afraid of Japanese before, now we got to be afraid of Americans. Fred turned his head around with his mad-looking face and said, We're all under Japanese instead of Americans. I asked him if anyone got killed. He said everyone was okay except his wife got hit in her leg, but the Japanese doctor fixed her. I asked him, How is my wife and kid? He said they are all okay. I would have liked to ask more, but he looked awful mad, and I was kind of afraid to ask him. I told him, Let's go now. And Willie told me they had been looking for me all over the place and couldn't find me or the boys with me. Also, one boy was missing, Sergei Artumanov. On the way home, we found him. He gave up because he saw us walking all together. When he walked up to us, he said, Aren't the Japanese going to hurt me? We told him, Oh, Japanese won't do any harm to you. He began to smile. Fred told me I had to go to the school. So when we got to the school, I walked in. All the doors had Japanese guards. In the schoolroom, I saw Mr. and Mrs. C. Foster Jones sitting at one of the school desks. I said hello to Mr. Jones, but one of the guards said to me, No, no, no talk to America. He was trying to tell me not to talk with the American. Foster said to me anyway, Well, Mike, the world has seemed to change today. We are under Japanese rule now. I was going to tell him it was his fault too, but I thought it was too late now. I just looked at him without saying a word. Just then, the Japanese MP came in with the American flag under his arm. He came to me and started to read a paper, which was a proclamation. Of course, he read it in his language. He had an interpreter with him. The MP stood in front of me and read the paper. I couldn't understand the words. The interpreter explained the meaning of the words, that the Japanese captured us from the US government. Now we are under Japanese government. The Japanese government will keep us under one condition, that from now on we must obey the Japanese. After reading the proclamation, he told me to go home and not to go around unless I get permission from Commander Yamadaki, Yamazaki. So I went home and my house was in bad shape. Everything was thrown on the floor. My door was spoiled, with eight bullet holes at the end of the house, two bullet holes in my stove, one going through to the fireplace, and my wife wasn't home. All my guns were gone and some other things were missing. I didn't care much about the guns. I hated to lose my watch with twenty-one jewels. All my papers were scattered on the floor. So I went down to the chief's house. My wife usually stays there if I am not home. By golly, she was there. I walked in and looked for my daughter. I didn't see her, so I asked my wife, Where is Tutty? She was sleeping. My wife was serving tea, and she asked me if I'd like to have a cup of tea. I sure needed it too. I told her yes. She gave me a cup, and I was just about to drink my tea when a Japanese came in. They were looking for me, he said. I just left the table and went out with him. He told me to help Mr. Jones move out of the school, so I went in there. A fellow named Kasukabe, an interpreter, was in the school, and Mr. and Mrs. Jones were picking up their things. The man had a sword. Mr. Jones had a big load under his arm. This Japanese wanted him to take some more. He said, Alec and Mike will take them to me. The Japanese said, No, you take them. And he slapped Mr. Jones on his face, knocked him down on the floor, and started to kick him. He picked him up and slapped him down again and kicked him out the door. But they didn't touch Mrs. Jones, and they didn't touch Alec and me. After he kicked Mr. Jones out, he pulled his sword out of its case and went after Mr. Jones. Of course, I couldn't see what happened after he kicked him out. Anyway, I was so scared I was shaking. It seemed like I was going to shake the whole village down. I was trying to brace myself, but I was still shaking. 
the Japanese took Mr. and Mrs. Jones to the trader's house. Of course, the trader, Mr. Fred Schroeder, is not on Atu. Lucky he's not on Atu. If he was, he might be dead or taken to Japan too. On the way, I found Mrs. Jones's slipper stuck in the dirt. As soon as I delivered the things to them, I just came to my house and stayed outside trying to cool myself from shaking. I didn't want to scare my wife. I walked into my house and my wife looked at me. She said, What's the matter, honey? You look pale. Oh, I said, I just don't feel good, maybe from catching a cold. You better warm up, honey, she said. She had a little supper ready. We didn't have much left in the house. Sugar was gone, and milk too. I had to bum milk Elizabeth Pross off for my baby. After I got eaten my supper, I helped Parry cleaning dishes, and I told her what happened to Mr. and Mrs. Jones. She said to me, Honey, they might do the same thing to us. I told her I don't think so. After we finished dishes, it is past 12 a.m. day started to break about 1.30 a.m. I went to bed with my wife. I couldn't go to sleep. I rolled in my bed. It was light and bright too. Boy, the machine guns go off in the air, and I heard a plane. I went out on my porch, and I see the plane was flying very low. It made a turn and goes out over the point without any bullet touching. I lit a fire in the stove, and when I had coffee ready, called my wife. She wasn't sleeping. She got up and had coffee with me. She said to me, Honey, what plane was the Japanese shooting at? I said to her it was an American plane. She said to me, God bless, they might bomb this place. As I was talking with my wife, I heard someone come. I looked out. It was Kasukabe, or Kasukabe, the fellow who kicked Mr. Jones last night. The Japanese was in a hurry too. I was wondering what was going on. He comes to my door and calls me. I went out. He said good morning, and I said good morning to him. Mr. Foster Jones is dead. Of course I didn't ask him how he died. They had two interpreters. One was named Imai, a young fellow, and the other was Kasukabi. He was higher, he had three stars. Mr. Imai had only two stars on his collar. When I get down near Schroeder's house, I met Mr. Imai for the first time. He said to me, Are you an interpreter too? Looks to me he is nice to talk with. I asked him how Foster died. He said he doesn't know either. Later, Mr. Kasukabe come to us and he started to talk. He was talking in his language. I couldn't understand what he said. I see him cut across his wrist with his finger. Someone came out and called him. He goes in the house, and Imai looked around before he spoke to me. Then he said Foster cut his own wrist with his pocket knife. I was thinking, after they capture Foster Jones, I don't see why they left his pocket knife for him. They called us in. He was half sunk in his own blood. They won't let me see his face or body. He was wrapped in a blanket. They told me to bury him without a coffin. So I dug a grave by our church. I measured the distance from the corner of the church with my eyes and tried to remember the wind direction. He was buried in the southwest corner of the church. The grave depth was seven feet and distance from church to grave fifteen feet. After I buried him, that was the end of him then, and I tried never to forget where I buried his body. And Imai was by me all the time I worked. Some of us Atuans stay by Mrs. Jones all the time. We don't know what the Japanese might do to her. Mr. Kasukabe lost one star. Mr. Imai received three stars. He got higher after Foster was murdered. Alex Prosoff, 1947-1988. A few of the boys ran away. Japanese landed and came running into the village, shooting. Lucky only one woman get hurt. She is shot in leg. So much shooting and machine gun bullets flying all around, Japanese kill some of their own men. They capture the village. Some Japanese take Mr. and Mrs. Jones and all the natives to schoolhouse and keep us there whole day without food and water. Mr. Jones is radio man. Mrs. Jones is schoolteacher. They very nice people. The Japanese keep us there until nine o'clock at night. The Joneses live in schoolhouse, but the Japanese want the building, so they tell them to leave. Mr. Jones tried to take little food. The Japanese beat and kicked them. They knocked them down. Some of us take a few of their things over to Mr. Schroeder's house, and then we could not do anything more for them, and the Japanese let us go home. Next morning the Japanese tell us Foster Jones is dead. Mike Locannon buried him by the church, 
He was just wrapped in blanket. Mike said his wrists are cut. We tried to make Mrs. Jones comfortable. Some of us stay with her all the time. She is sick and has bad cuts on her wrists too. But she gets well. Japanese have taken down our flag, but Inokinti gets it and hides it. I hide the church money. The Japanese go through our houses and take many things until one officer stop them. They put lines around our houses, and Japanese soldiers are not allowed to bother us. Olian Prokopyuf, Golodov, 1981. The year 1942, on a Sunday morning, the Japanese armed forces came and captured us. They came from the interior of our island after daybreak. That morning, a Japanese airplane flew around the village three times. The teacher, Etta Jones, was informed of this by the villagers. Instead of informing the authorities, the teacher told the villagers that there were lots of American patrol planes patrolling this area. After the teacher told them that, the villagers felt secure. After they came down from the hills, it was said that our village was surrounded by them. After that, the villagers went up to the observation hill and saw the Japanese fleet anchored in the bay on the other side. As they were attacking in force, one of our ladies was shot in her leg. As they were firing their weapons in all directions during their assault, their forces also hit their own men, and it is believed that a few of their own men had been killed. After they came, they went to Alfred's wife's house. Since my house was being shot at, and since I was being scared, I went to Alfred's wife's house carrying my three-year child, Elizabeth. From there we went to Alfred's wife's house, where she was lying in bed with a sore leg. After we went to Alfred's wife's house, the Japanese soldiers surrounded 62 it. They faced the house and had their rifles aimed at it. So at that point in time, Perokovia, Paraskovia, sat down. I then thought to myself, what if I get shot standing up? I would drop the child and she might hurt herself. So I too sat down. The Japanese soldiers did not shoot, and an officer got there in time to give orders to move away from the house. So the soldiers moved. The Japanese had an interpreter who spoke English pretty well. He told us to follow him to the schoolhouse, and we followed him there. After we arrived at the school, when a fire was made outside, I was afraid that the schoolhouse was going to be set afire with all of us in there. Since we weren't being set on fire, we were asked if we were all present. We stated that three of our young men were out, they waited for the young men to come back to the village, but there was no sign of them. The young men did not return from hiding until some of the village men went out and escorted them back to the village. Only then did they return. The young men were brought home, then we were sent back to our houses. When we went into our homes, everything was scattered on our floors, even the Easter eggs were on the floor. It was never determined what the Japanese searched for. We all stayed inside our homes. The guards stayed by our homes with bayonets. They were standing around guarding like that for three days. Once daybreak came, some flares were shot into the air. We went under our beds because of being scared, not knowing what was happening. We lived on Atu three months after the Japanese came. They guarded our houses all the time. We could go outside for fresh air, but not away from the houses, except that they let us go out and fish once in a while. We had to eat our own food. We didn't have to give the Japanese any food. They didn't bother our women. More and more Japanese come to Atu. Many of their men get sick. They make their camp all around our village. They pile their things on the beach. One time I tell them wrong thing, and storm comes and they lose lots of their things. They get very mad and tell me next time I tell them wrong thing, they kill me. All summer long the Japanese stayed on Atu. We did not have much food, but sometimes they would let us go out in dory to fish. They made us take little Japanese flag on our boat. We used to make fun of it and say it looks like target. We cannot hunt wood, so we have to tear boards from inside our homes to burn. The Atuans boarded a merchant ship, the Yokomaru, in mid-September of 1942. The Japanese soldiers allowed them to bring food, blankets and even furniture with them, perhaps with the idea that their move to Japan might be permanent. The village was standing when they left, but US forces destroyed it in subsequent air and sea raids, as well as in the Battle of Atu. The trip to Japan began on September 14th and took about two weeks. Alfred Prokopiev's and Elizabeth Prosov's mother, Anisia Prokopiev, 
died on board ship between Atu and Kiska, and she was buried at sea. At Kiska, the Atuans were transferred to another ship, the Nagata Maru. Their quarters were in a cargo hold that had been used to carry coal. They had to stay in the hold except for daily periods on deck. The ship finally arrived at the Japanese city of Otaru, on the west side of Hokkaido Island, at the end of September. The passengers were very dirty from the coal dust and had not bathed since they left Atu. Their first house was a vacant railroad employee dormitory on Wakatake-cho. They stayed on the second floor in four rooms, each about 142 square feet. The furniture and belongings they had brought were stored at the rear of the dormitory. Stewart, 2008, 302, 303. It must have been a big culture shock for the Atuans to come to live in an industrial city. Otaru's population in 1940 was about 164,000, somewhat larger than its 2008 population of about 138,000. The city is in Ainu territory, but the Ainu had been decimated by disease several centuries earlier. Today, Otaru is a tourist destination for Japanese and Russians, Mr. Kawashima, one of the Japanese soldiers who had occupied the village, visited the Atuans in Otaru in late 1942 or early 1943. He said that two of the boys, Ivan, probably John Golodov, and his younger brother Nick, hugged him in greeting, and that Ivan told him their sister Helen had already died. There are differing reports of the Atuans' diet in Otaru. In August 1942, a Japanese soldier who visited them saw that they had bread, rice, meat and vegetables. He thought they were eating better than most Japanese, Stuart 2008, 303. At that point, the Unangan probably still had food they had brought with them from Atu. Inokenti Golodov remembered that at first the food was only slightly meagre, rice, bread and a little fish and pickled radishes. In addition to not having enough to eat, Many of the Atuans were weakened by other medical circumstances, particularly tuberculosis. Several of them died of that disease in Japan. Dr. Satoru Nagushi examined the Atuans soon after they arrived in Otaru and found that about half of them were suffering from acute tuberculosis. He thought their conditions were exacerbated by their meagre diet on Otaru, which lacked protein and calories. Several died from beriberi, a disease of malnutrition. This may have been caused by a diet almost entirely made up of white rice. Mike Hodikoff and his son both died of food poisoning in 1945 from eating rotten garbage. The Atu residents worked digging dolomite, a kind of clay, from an open pit while they were there. Nick remembers going with his mother to the clay mine and waiting for her while she worked. According to Inokenti Golodov, the Atuans didn't work very hard. Although they were supposed to be paid between one half and one yen per day, they were not paid at the time. When they were released, those who had worked were given about $700 in yen to take back to the United States. Unfortunately, this money was collected by US officials and the equivalent in American money never given to the workers. The Unangan worked only during the first part of their internment and even then, on most days, only a few of them worked. The voluntary labour of Aluts contrasted sharply with the treatment of Chinese and Korean prisoners, who were marched to work every day. In 1944, the 29 of the original 40, Atuans still living, were moved from the Wakatake-cho dormitory to a larger house at Shimizu-cho, which had previously served as clergy quarters for a Shinto shrine. Partitions divided the families. The Atuans' new home was farther from the clay pits, and they didn't work after that. Their declining health may have also prevented them from working. After the Japanese surrendered, the Atuans were able to walk more freely around the city of Otaru. Alex Prosov even remembered that they met a Russian couple named Sofiev and attended Russian Orthodox Church services. In 1942, a count of foreign nationals in Japan found 48 old Russian residents living in Hokkaido, Foreign Resident Population 2011. Contrary to most reports, Stewart found that the Atuans were allowed much freedom of movement in Otaru throughout their stay in the city. According to him, the children frequented the candy store, 
and the adults bought food at the butcher and fish shops. It is unlikely, however, that they had money to make such purchases, which also contradict the malnutrition and starvation of the Atuans. Communication between the Atuans and the Japanese was in English, while the Atuans spoke Unangam Tunu, Aliut, among themselves. Nick Golodov remembered that the Japanese often wrote notes in English to convey their orders or questions. On Atu, Angelina Hodikov served for a time as an interpreter, translating the Japanese soldiers' English into Unangam Tunu, Jolis 1994-16. In Japan, the Unangan were expected to learn Japanese. Stewart, 2008, 303. A Japanese linguist, Ken Hattori, visited them in 1943 and recorded and made notes on their language. Inokenti Golodov said that at first the Japanese were pretty rough, but later they got friendlier. The Unangan internees remembered beatings and other mistreatment by guards. Julia Golodov went for three days without food and water and had to shovel snow in her bare feet as punishment for shouting at one of the guards about her daughter's death. Japanese sources, too, acknowledged that the Atuans were sometimes victims of violence at the hands of their guards. At least one of their captors became their friend, however, Mr Shikanai, the policeman who lived with them in both of their houses in Otaru. On Christmas Eve in 1944, Shikanai obtained goat meat and turkey for a party, and the Unangan played the accordion and danced into the night. After the war was over, when an American army plane came to take the Atuans back to the United States, they had a sake drinking party with Shikanai. The main hardship of internment in Japan was the lack of healthful food. After their own food was gone, the Atuans began to starve and suffer from malnutrition. They rarely got any fruits or vegetables, only a small ration of rice. They could see that their Japanese guards were hungry too. Forty people came to Otaru, but only twenty-four left. Twenty-one people died, including four of the five babies born while they were in Japan. After three days, we were taken aboard a ship and we were on our way. My house was opened and burned. We were taken out to the ship when it was getting dark. After spending the night on board the ship with much whistling and running about going on, and because of our ignorance of exactly what was happening, we were very anxious. Later on, we were told that an American submarine was detected, and that was the cause for all the commotion. A shortcut was said to be taken to where they were going. I was not aware of what shortcut they meant. After travelling for some time, we were told that we were passing by a navy yard. All during the voyage we were kept in a hold which was very unpleasant smelling, and it was also dark. We never once saw daylight until we reached Japan. When the Japanese were ready to leave in September, they carried all our stuff onto their ships for us. We took our blankets, beds, chairs, everything except our houses. The Japanese treated us pretty good. Two of them spoke English. None of us were scared when they took us on the ship. No women cried. Then we went to Kiska and went to another ship, a bigger one. We stayed at Kiska for one day. From the 7th of June to the 1st of September 1942, we had been told to be ready to go to Japan. So we got everything ready. Imai tells us we better take as much food to Japan as we can. It is hard to get food in Japan, maybe. So each family takes flour, sugar, barrels of salt fish, we don't know how we are going to live in Japan, so we take tents, stoves, fishnets, windows and doors also. Good thing we did. One day, the 14th of September 1942, a coal carrier came and they told us to get ready. We're going to Japan. We take our stuff to the vessel. We got aboard late, past midnight. They put us down in the hold where the coal had been. Everything was all black and dirty. Some of the little kids didn't want to leave Atu. They cried, but the Japanese soldiers picked them up and threw them down in the hold too. There are 42 of us Atu people and Mrs Jones. Some old people are scared very bad. The vessel starts off for Kiska and one of our people died on the boat. It was Alfred Prokopov's mother and the captain told us to throw her overboard, so we let her go overboard in between Kiska and Atu Pass. Next morning when we got to Kiska, there were plenty of Japanese there, as in Atu. Some houses are bombed, three submarines were there, 
Three sunken boats were there too, and about twelve destroyers were there. Another vessel was a big army transport. That was the one that would take us to Japan. Everybody was kind of afraid because if an American sub or plane comes, it will be our end. That evening we take off for Japan. On the way to Japan, we were kept in the hatch and not allowed to come outdoors. When we reached Japan, the captain collided with the dock, and when this happened, we were thrown from our seated position right onto the deck. Then we thought to ourselves, Ay, 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 did our ship get shot? This was a scary experience. Finally, we were gathered on top of the dock. Then we were sprayed. Later on, we were picked up by a vehicle and taken to a black house. Since we fed ourselves with our own food from home during the trip, the only different food that was given to us was some warm rice. It was the only warm food we ate. When asked if we were hungry, we told them yes. A meal was cooked for us that day. They brought our food on a tray. Chopsticks, which we did not know how to use, were given to us to use. There was a policeman present there with his partner. So as soon as they started talking with each other and not paying attention to us, we would quickly eat with our hands. When the policeman turned towards us, we would pretend like nothing had happened at all. We were also served an unusual-looking cooked bird with its feathers still on it. We felt suspicious of the cooked bird, and so we did not eat it. After we were fed, we were put to bed. Then one day in September, a coal carrier came and they told us to get ready, we are going to Japan. One Japanese man who was kind to us tell us we better take as much food with us as we can, for it is hard to get food in Japan, maybe. So we do. Each family takes flour, sugar and barrels of salt fish. We were all put down in the hold of the coal carrier where coal had been. Everything was all black and dirty. Some of the little children did not want to leave Atu. They cried, but Japanese soldiers picked them up and threw them down in the holds too. There were 42 of us, including old men and women, young people and children. Most of the women and older girls were pregnant. First we went to Kiska. A white man, Mr. House, was with us here. He was a Navy man on Kiska when the Japanese took it. There were ten American Navy men there. The Japanese took all of them prisoners, but Mr. House ran away and hid from the Japanese. He ate things he found, plants and seabirds along the beach. But finally, he couldn't find anything more because he didn't know where to look, so he gave himself up to the Japanese. We never saw him after we got to Japan. My wife's mother got sick on the coal carrier and died. They made us just throw her into the sea. We could go on deck once a day for fresh air, but if we were passing by any cities, we had to stay in the hold. After 13 or 14 days, one night, about 11pm, we landed at the city of Otaru on the island of Hokkaido in Japan. We stayed on board the ship until daylight. When morning came, some Japanese soldiers, some policemen, and some Japanese doctors came on board. They examined all of us but did not find any disease. They took us ashore then. We did not see Mrs. Jones again. I was just wondering where they would take us when they brought us to a house that looked like nobody had lived in it for a very long time, maybe fifteen or ten years. It was very dirty, but even then the Japanese made us take off our shoes before we could go in. They asked us all kinds of questions about America. They asked me if Americans are good people, if we have any military outposts on our island, if we know where there were outposts in the Aleutian Islands how often the Coast Guard and American warships came into Atu Harbour. One of our elders told us not to tell them the truth, so we did not tell them the right things. They asked us how many white people lived with us, and we told them just two, the teacher and the radio man. I told them the Japanese killed the radio man. They asked us which army we liked best, Japanese or Americans. Mike and I were the only ones who talked to them. I told them I could understand English and that they were very kind to us. As long as Americans fight for my country, I'll be on their side. I told them the Japanese destroyed our homes, made us prisoners, and put us on land where we couldn't speak their language. So I cannot say the Japanese are good people. All of us were kept in one house. There were 42 of us in a five-room house. We put our mattresses and blankets on the floor to sleep on. It was getting winter, and we did not have enough blankets to keep warm. We had only one stove we brought with us from Atu. The women cooked for all of us on it. 
The Japanese did give us little heaters, but we did not have enough coal to keep us warm. They gave us only one bucket of coal for the whole day. Our mattresses were laid on the floor. The pillows were also given to us, and they were very hard, but we did not complain. The blankets that were given to us were almost as thick as the mattresses, but we used them anyway. Every morning the floor was mopped. The house that we were staying at had a kitchen downstairs. We had a stove that we had taken from Atu, which we used there. We had soup that looked like grass and some dried rice. When we ran out of grass soup, we started making rice soup. Before this, we ate the food that we brought along from Atu, like the dried fish and salted fish. But when we ran out of food, we were given vegetables like carrots and potatoes. After eating the boiled potatoes, we would have very bad stomach aches, and they were very painful. One day, we were told that some officials were coming to visit us. A Japanese cook was brought in for us. They told us not to leave, and the Japanese cook put wood into the oven. He lit it, and as a result, smoke filled the room. I can't remember whether or not cooking took place that day. We were once again grouped, and questions were asked of us. They asked if we were eating good food. We did not give them any reply. They once again asked us if we wanted to talk. We refused to talk. Then after that, we were given food once more. When we got to Japan, we landed at Otaru on the west side of Hokkaido. We went to the town, or city, I guess. It was kind of big. They put us in one house, a big wooden house. Two policemen lived there with us. They gave us rice, bread and some fish once in a while, and a little bit of pickled radishes. A girlfriend, Kasha San, saved my life. She was a nurse, and she was good to me. She gave me extra rice and brought me eggs. She talked a little bit of English. She was there for about a year, then she went away. Then I didn't get any extra food. We were hungry too. At first we did all right because we ate the flour, sugar and fish we brought from Atu. The Japanese gave us only two cups of rice for about ten people a day. When our food was gone, we could not buy any more from the Japanese. Then we began to get very hungry. While we were at Otaru for about three years, we worked digging clay. We worked about eight hours a day. We didn't work very hard. We dug it off the top of the ground and took it to the factory in a wheelbarrow. The clay was white. I guess they made dishes out of it. Our policeman took us up in the morning. We walked, and then he came for us in the afternoon. For lunch we ate the rice we brought with us in a little tin box. We had our own spoon. I never learned to use chopsticks. We never heard any news about the war. We had electric lights. At night we talked or patched up our clothes. We didn't have anything to read. That land where we were was very hot. We worked with picks and shovels, shoveling away at the clay. Then the clay was dried and crushed. The clay was also being worked on in the factories during winter. While working on this clay, a particle of it went in my right eye. I was afraid that I was going to lose my eyesight, but I have managed to arrive here, on Atka, without having to wear glasses. Alex Prosov, 1947-1988 A month after we get to Japan, we had to go to work for the Japanese. I dug clay for a week, and then I went to work in the clay factory. It was hard work. We worked from seven in the morning to five at night and got one day of rest in two weeks. The women, most of them, were put to work too. As things were, our men were put to work. Shortly after that, they started admitting our people to the hospital. The people were getting sick one after the other until I was almost the only one left at home to cook. While I was doing that, they took my husband to the hospital. After they took my husband, my children were starving. So when I went to fetch some water, I would pick orange peelings off the ground. Then I would cook them on the top of the heater. Then I fed them to my children, and only then would they stop crying for a while. Shortly thereafter, they admitted my children to the hospital. They asked me to come to the hospital. So I went there and ay ay ay! The people that were admitted to the hospital were very sick. That day a few went home. Being unable to hear what was happening, I begged to be returned to work. So they started me working on clay. Later on, those who were sent home from the hospital took ill again. They were taken once more to the hospital. We were allowed to visit the hospital for checkups. Whenever they did that, 
I would ask my people what they were doing to them. They replied, We are being inoculated. Ay, ay, ay. We did not know what was being done to them. But then the people were dying. Lots of people died there. My daughter and son were among those who were in the hospital. They would say, Mother, come here and scratch me. So I would go over to him, her, and, not knowing exactly where they wanted me to scratch, I would scratch and then move away from them. The reason why they were unable to specify where they wanted to be scratched was because they could not move. When my husband was close to death, he sent for me. I went to the hospital, and he gave me some cigarettes which he had stashed away. Then I stayed awake with him most of the night. Then he told me if I were sleepy to go to sleep. So I went to sleep, and during my slumber he died. When I was awakened, I got up, and I noticed that in our religious custom when a person dies, he is not dressed, but I watched them dress him. After he was dressed, he was taken out. I did not know what they did to him. It was not until my Leonti died that I went to where they must have taken him. Leonti was put in an oven, and I was told to light some flowers, so I did. Then I went to the other room. After that they pulled him out, and I did not like what I saw. I approached a Japanese priest and asked him if it was a sin to do that. He told me that the reason why they did that was because they did not have any burying space. They said that they hardly had any space for burying people. We lost 21 people in Japan. My stepmother gets sick first. She got TB, and the Japanese took her to a kind of hospital. But there is no heat and very little food, so she died. Some died of beriberi. Our chief, Mike Hodikoff, and his son George, ate from the garbage can and got poisoned food. Lots of children and babies died because they were hungry and had nothing but rice. When the Japanese came to Atu, we were 42 people, and after the schoolteacher died, 41 left Atu. But many Atu people died in Japan. They died of starvation, I guess. Only 25 people came back from Japan. The ones who didn't come back ate the rice for about two years, then they couldn't eat it any more. They were sick and couldn't, and the Japanese didn't have anything else to give them. We never had any fruit or vegetables. I don't know if our policemen had any other food. All I ever saw them eat was rice. We had both white and brown rice. My two brothers and one sister died in Japan. They never buried them. They burned them. They gave the bones and ashes back to us, and now they are buried at Atka. They sent them back after we got to Atka. Alex Prosov, 1947, 1988. One of the hardest things was we could not bury our dead. There are no burials in Japan. All are burned. When our people died, they were burned too, and the Japanese gave us little boxes to put the bones in. This was hard to have to pick up the bones of our loved ones. We kept all our boxes carefully because we wanted to take them home to be buried some day. I noticed that when a Japanese body was burned, the bones did not fill the box, but when an Aleut was burned, the box was not big enough to hold what was left. I told a Japanese guard that his people have small frames, much smaller than Atu people. Must be because his people eat too much rice. When we first get to Japan, Japanese seem to have enough food, but later lots of Japanese hungry too. We never saw any Red Cross packages of food or clothing while we were in prison. No medicine ever came either. By 1944, we got so hungry we would dig in the hog boxes when the guards were not looking. Whatever we found, we would wash it and cook it and try to eat it. When spring came, we would work after five o'clock in some of the Japanese gardens nearby for a little extra food. In summer, we sometimes helped the herring fishermen. One time I went fishing in the bay to show the Japanese fishermen how we fish in Atu. All I caught was old boot. We could not eat that. Once we killed two dogs and ate them, the men only. We gave our rice to the girls. Next day my stomach is full, I can work. After we dig garden in the fall, they let us pick up anything they don't want. So we keep alive, some of us. Some of us died, and sometimes I think I too would die like the others and never see my home again. When we were there, I used to think Japan must be one of the poorest countries in the whole world. In that town of Otaru of about 25,000 people, not one painted house did I see. One house only had a coat of tar. Everyone worked and worked every day. 
Young boys and girls worked in the factories near the house where we lived. One day I went up to the old Japanese who was kind to us and asked him which side was winning, and he said the Japanese were getting weak. They had plenty men but no guns and things to fight with. I saw some big Japanese cruisers, two destroyers while there, but one battleship. The officers had good clothing, but the soldiers poor, except their shoes. The officers slapped their men, sometimes hard in the face for a little thing, maybe a gun not clean or something. I noticed Japanese soldier does not have much freedom. On Atu, most were young, 25 or 19 years old. In Japan, they were maybe 50 or older. We did not have much clothing. All I had was one pair of pants, two shirts, one pair of socks, and one towel in two years. One old Japanese who talked some Russian and English was kind to us. Sometimes we would give him a piece of clothing to sell, and he would get us a little food. We had to learn to talk Japanese, even the little children. Japanese said they would kill us if we didn't. Sometimes we were beaten and our women whipped. Julia Golodov once went three days without food to eat or water to drink. This was her punishment for talking back to the Japanese and blaming them when her little girl died. She said it was Japanese fault. They made her shovel snow when she was barefoot too. She did not die. I had arguments with the guards over their gods. One of them wanted me to pray to their gods, but I told him I would pray to my own god. I asked them where were their gods, but they could not tell me. I saw many statues of the gods they pray to. Most were of Buddha, though. They had a funny custom of taking a dragon-like piece of wood into their houses and talking while they open and shut its big fiery mouth. What they say, I don't know. Another custom was to send men with big umbrella-like hats and dressed in white to our camp. They held out small cup and begged for money. Finally, guards told them it's no use, we did not have any money. One day the policeman who guarded the Atuans told them that the war was over. The Atuans painted the letters POW on the roof of their building so the American planes would know where they were. Planes flew over, dropping drums filled with delicious food. Nick Golodov particularly remembers the canned peaches they brought. Some Japanese sources recalled that the Atuans defied orders to share some of the food and cigarettes with their friends among the Japanese guards. Stewart, 1978-34. After the Atuans heard the war was over, they were able to leave their quarters and walk around the city. Lokanin, 1988, 239. When they left, about two weeks later, police officer Shikanai and his superior, Sergeant Endo, accompanied the Atuans as far as Chitose Air Base. The Unangan requested that Mr. Shikanai come with them further to Atgusi Air Base outside of Tokyo, and he did. Stewart, 1978, 35-36. The Atuans were given the cremated remains of those who had died in Japan, and they put all the boxes of bones of those who had died together in a big box, Lokanin, 1988-239. Unfortunately, the bones were lost on the way back to the United States. Alex Prosov said that while they were in Okinawa, the Atuans left all their baggage, including the box of bones, inside a big fence. After a big storm, the box and all the rest of their things were gone. Prosov, 1988, 248. The box of remains was eventually recovered and sent to Atka. The cremated remains of the deceased Atuans were buried near the Atka church, but outside of the church grounds because the Russian Orthodox Church does not allow cremation. The Atuans got on a plane, the first flight any of them had ever been on. They stayed in Osaka one night, then went on to Okinawa. A huge storm grounded them there for several weeks. Then they flew to Manila, where they stayed in army tents and were taken around by military men. They boarded a ship and set out for San Francisco. It took ten or eleven days, Nick Golodov remembers, but it seemed like forever. Some government or Red Cross workers met the boat and took the Atuans to a hotel, giving them money for lodging and clothing. They were in San Francisco for a week or ten days and did a lot of walking around. The Atuans took a train to Seattle, the first train trip any of them had taken. In that city, they attended services at the Greek Orthodox Church of the Assumption, which Alex Prosov called the Church of Seven Domes. 
Some of the people went to the hospital in Tacoma, Prosov 1988-248, for treatment of tuberculosis. The remaining Attu residents finally boarded a boat to return to the Aleutians on December 12, 1945. They got to Unalaska on the 19th and from there travelled to Atka with a stop in Adak, Lokanin, 1988-240. They had hoped to return to Attu, but they were told there weren't enough people left to resettle their village. Sixteen Attu survivors arrived in Atka on December 21st. When the military transport ship David W. Branch brought them to Atka, the residents of that village were still in the process of rebuilding their village, which the US Army had burned after the residents were relocated to southeast Alaska in 1942. The Atuans had to stay with Atkan families until the military could build houses for them. Fortunately, Nick Golodov's mother Olian was from Atka, so she and her children, Nick, Greg and Elizabeth, were able to stay with their relatives. The Sniggeroffs. Later, Olian married an Atka man. Inokenti Golodov married an Atka woman and began raising a family. See photos P81. Willie Golodov was reunited with his wife Julia, but then, like several others, had to go to a hospital in Tacoma. Jolice, 1994, 20. Four Atu children, including 18-year-old John Golodov and 20-year-old Angelina Hodikov, were sent to vocational school in Eklutna. One of the teachers there wrote an article about these Atu survivors. She said Angelina carried with her a scrap of paper that said, Father, Mike Hodkoff, burn, sick at Atu, died in Japanese camp at Oturu Island of Hokkaida. Mother, Anisia Prokopov, born at Atu, died at Atu, 1940. Three brothers, two named George and Leonti, Mike died when Japanese came. Another brother, George, died in Japanese camp. Sisters Mary and Annie died at Atu when the Japanese came. Brother Stephen, age 14, birthday Jan. 16th, taken prisoner, now thought to be at Atka. Butts, 1948. The Atuans were unhappy that they could not return to their home. Alan May, who had visited Atu in 1936, corresponded after the war with several of the Atu people who were hospitalised with tuberculosis in Washington state. Mike Lakanin wrote to him that he missed Mike Hodikoff and his smile, and that he was worried about his wife and his friend John Hodikoff, both of whom also had tuberculosis and were in another hospital. Mike Lakanin did not think the Atuans and Atkans were getting along very well with each other yet. He wrote, We rather be on Atu instead Atka. Lokanin, 1949. Ted Bank, a visitor to Atkar in 1948, said one of the troubles the Atuans had in their new home was that the Atkans wouldn't allow them to use their wood to build new houses. The Atuans thought the Atkans looked down on them. Bank, 1956, 78. By June 1947, only 11 Atu survivors were at Atke. One was at Fort Richardson in the army, John Golodov. Four were at Tacoma Hospital, Willie Golodov, Annie Hodikoff, John Hodikoff and Mary Prokopov, and six students were at Mount Edgecombe, Sergei Artumanov, Marina Hodikoff, Martha Hodikoff, Stephen Hodikoff, Agnes Prosov and Fekla Prosov. Angelina Hodikoff had moved to Dillingham. One consequence of the move to Atka was the exacerbation of rivalry and basketry between the villages. The Atuans and Atkans had different basket-weaving styles and kept them secret from each other. The Atuan women no longer had access to their favourite kind of grass, Shapsnikov and Hudson, 1974-50. The Atuan style, previously known as the finest form of Unangan basketry, died out with the Atuan women. Atu also once had a distinct dialect of Unangam Tunu, but with the death of so many Atuan speakers, the dialect was no longer spoken. The people continued to die. All that was left was just a few of us. Time passed until we heard an airplane. We went out and we stepped out to look. We saw drums coming down in parachutes, and evidently the plane was an American plane and the drums contained food, so we stayed up and ate all night. Alex Prosov, 1947-1988 one day, 1945, we learned from hearing Japanese talking that Germany has lost the war. 
So I went to friendly Japanese and asked him if it is true Germany lose the war, and he said yes. He said the Americans now have Germany. The Japanese seem very sad over Germany losing. After that, we had blackouts every night. They put us to work digging trenches. One day in August, while we were digging a trench in front of a policeman's house, we hear noise from radio coming from open window. We know enough Japanese to know it is Japanese emperor telling his people that Japan had lost the war. He told them they must now work very hard to live. That afternoon, the Jap guard tell us to stop working. They did not tell us war is over, but we know it because things change. Japanese take their things out of caves where they had them stored. They said it is because of nice weather and they want to dry stored clothing. There are no more blackouts either. I asked them why did they turn on lights at night and where are the sirens that used to blow when enemy planes are near? They said the Americans are over on the southern side of Japan now, so lights don't bother. But not once did they tell us they lost the war. Seven days later, a B-29 flew over very low and saw the POW sign the Japanese built for us. They circled it four times and then flew so low we could see people leaning out. They dropped drums of food, candy and cigarettes, also two bundles of clothing and shoes. The next week they came again and dropped more things. Three weeks later, three Americans came. It was then we were really happy. The Japanese tried to make the Americans think they had been good to us. They had our camp cleaned up and gave the Americans good food. We told our stories before the Americans and the Japanese. We told of the beatings they had given us, of the months of cold and sickness and starvation. We told of our people who died of neglect. When we finished, the Japanese tore up their stories they had ready. The Americans told us not to take any more orders from the Japanese. We were free. They told us an American plane would take us away in two weeks. We did not work for Japanese now. We went walking all over this city that had been our home for three years. One day, four of us went walking and saw a church that looked like our own church at Atu, with big dome and a Russian cross. We walked all around the church but could not get in. We knocked at the door for a long time. Then someone came. What a surprise. Grey hair and blue eyes. Is this a Russian church? I asked. Yes, answered the old couple in English. May we come in? Of course. Where do you come from? They asked. Come in. We come from Atu, Alaska, I said. Where is that? They ask. Come in. We went in and found a map. On it is little dot, Atu. We showed them where we come from. They said, Oh, you are Americans. What can we do for you boys? We want to go to church, I told them. I told them we have been Japanese prisoners three years. Only church we have is little holy picture Mike sneaked with him. All right, the old couple said. Come back tomorrow. So the next day we all went back and had church. It was very nice to have church again in a church like ours. The old couple told us their name was Sofif. These old people came from Russia many years before. They lived in China before they came to Japan. They suffered very much in the war, too. We went and had church with these old people once more before we left Otaru. Before we were going to leave Otaru, I went to Japanese and said, We want money for work we do. They finally gave me handful of little paper bills, 50 yen size. I divided among my people. When it was time to go, we asked for kind old Japanese man. We took up collection for him, and he went home happy. After the food was dropped, the Americans came. We could see cars running around, and they made a lot of smoke. These cars had to be cranked to get them started. So one got tired of cranking a car before it could be started. They also had some cars that didn't make any noise at all when running. Then we were taken inside the house. We were asked if we wanted to go home. We all said, yes. They were Americans and they told us that the war was over and we were going to be taken home. That next day, we were taken to the airport. We stayed there for three nights. Our flight must have been late or something. I never did find out. About September 1945, the Red Cross helped us leave Otaru. An American army plane took us to Okinawa. We had a big sake party at Otaru just before we left. Our policemen got drunk too. 
We wanted to take him with us, so they let him go to Okinawa with us, then they took him back. When we left our house at Otaru, we didn't use the doors. We went out through the windows because everyone was feeling so good. A Japanese civilian gave us the sake, two or three bottles, almost a gallon in each one. I like sake. That was the only party we had while we were in Japan. We finally departed from that place and we landed on a number of islands. I don't even know the names of the islands. We saw where the Americans dropped their atomic bomb. It looked like a bundle of kindling wood. The place appeared demolished when viewed from the airplane. When we were in Japan, we used to be evacuated to the interior whenever the Americans dropped their bombs. Then we flew once more. I still can't remember the names of the three islands over which we flew. I think we were still flying, and I remembered Okinawa, because we were there for two and a half weeks. Then, once again, we were airborne, heading for the mainland. When we arrived on the mainland, it was unbearably hot there. We caught a boat from Manila bound for San Francisco. During our trip, we encountered a storm, and we were told that we were in Alaska waters. We were hoping that they could let us off at Unalaska, but instead the boat continued on to San Francisco. At the end of two weeks, we get on C-47 and fly to Okinawa. We take all our little boxes of dead in one big box, our church books and our trunks. The pilots flew over Nagasaki and showed us where the atom bomb dropped. It was very awful. Nothing left of that big city. At Okinawa, all our boxes and things are put inside a big wire fence. We had a bad tornado there, and when the storm was over, we looked for our things. But the big box of all our dead people, everything is gone. Someone told us they would look for our things, and they put us on the transport boat Brewster for San Francisco. Then I really felt I was going home. When we got back to the States, we went to San Francisco, on a Navy boat. We stayed in a hotel, and the Red Cross took care of us and took us to see the city, and we went across the Golden Gate Bridge. We stayed there for about two weeks, then we went to Seattle. Alex Prosoff, 1947-1988, San Francisco. That is a very beautiful city, I think. It looks like heaven to me. Of all the cities I've been in, I like that one best. Red Cross and welfare people were at the boat, and doctors and nurses. They took care of us and took us to Lancashire Fifth Street Hotel, and give us money to pay our hotel fare and buy food and clothing. Miss Van Every of Indian Affairs took us around in her car to see things. But mostly we walk. We walk all day, Elizabeth and me, just looking. Elizabeth wore out two pairs of shoes and the heel off one. He looked very funny walking with the heel off, but we walked until I saw a sign of a little hammer hitting the heel, and we went there. It's a shoemaker's place, and he fixed his heel. Then we walked some more. Elizabeth always saw things he wanted. I want this and this and this, he said. We were in San Francisco one week and two days, and we were so busy walking and looking we did not have time to go to church. In Seattle we stayed near White Center. We had a good time. First we stayed in a hotel, then in a camp, a house with a kitchen and everything. I stayed with my brother's family. When we went to Seattle we went to Church of Seven Domes. Some of our people went to the hospital in Tacoma. We stayed in Seattle many days, then we got on the boat branch and came to Atka. We wanted to go to Atu. They told us soldiers were still on Atu and no more village. We had to come to Atka. They would give us a new house here. From San Francisco we took a train to Seattle. From Seattle we boarded a ship, branch, and later arrived at Adak. When we were in Seattle we were there for some time, and it was getting close to Christmas. We did not really want to go home, but we were brought here. At that time they dropped off many soldiers on Adak. We were brought here from Adak in a small tug. I had gotten used to the big ship that brought us from Seattle, and I did not feel very safe on that small tug. When the tug arrived at Atka, a truck picked us up and we were taken to the school. At the school we were assigned to where we were going to live. I was placed in Cedar's house. A year passed, then the houses were built for us. Army Quonset huts were made for us to live in, and we stayed in the huts for another year. Then our houses were finished, so we moved in. Since then, they have been our houses for a long time. Today, whenever there is a storm, I don't trust my poor house.
After Seattle, we went to Adak and stayed there one night. Then they took us to Atka. The new houses were already built. The government built them for us. We tried to go to Atu, but they told us we were not enough people, so the government wouldn't let us go to Atu. The government told us to live with the Atika people. So we got to Attica on December 11th, 1945. Then I was single, but today I have a wife and three kids, two girls and a boy. My oldest girl is 19, and my youngest, the boy, is 16. Now the Atu people like it at Atka. My wife is an Attica woman, and I don't want to go back to Atu.